Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I'm Larry Gifford, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2017 at the age of 45. Uh, I sit on the Michael J. Fox Foundation's Patient Council, and I host the podcast, When Life Gives You Parkinson's, which you can find linked in the resource list on your screen. So today we're going to discuss a few things, how Parkinson's can impact your sex life, sexual changes women can experience, sexual changes men can experience, how medications can impact sex drive, how to treat sexual dysfunction with Parkinson's. Some housekeeping items before we dive in. Uh, you, you are able to submit questions throughout the hour. You should see a Q&A box near the middle of your screen type your questions there, and we'll do our best to get to as many of those questions as we can throughout the hour. Also, we will be providing the slides from today's webinar for download. You should see a box called Resource List on your screen. Go ahead and click the link there, and the document will open in a new browser window, and you can save or print from there. So let's meet our panelists for today's discussion. With me today is Dr. Camille Vaughn, an Associate Professor and Section Chief of Geriatrics and Gerontology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you for being here, Dr. Vaughn. Thanks so much for the invitation. And Dr. Daniela Whitman is an Associate Professor of Urology at the University of Michigan and a Certified Sex Therapist. We're glad you're with us too, Dr. Whitman. It's a pleasure to be here, thank you. Now, I want to start with something that may make us all just uh, take a deep breath and relax. Uh, <laughs> we are all in this uh, sexual adventure together. Uh, the, the headline of this slide alone makes me feel better about myself. Uh, sexual challenges are common with people with Parkinson's. Whew, I'm not an oddball. Um, some studies suggest as many as 70 to 80% of people with PD experience some aspects of sexual dysfunction. Uh, does that uh, line up with your experience, uh, Camille? Yes, we actually uh, often have uh, people bring this up to our attention if we've kind of created the environment to make it easy to talk about. And a lot of people do uh, report uh, complaints, and there are often things that we can do to help. Uh, there was a Fox Insight study, and 35% uh, of the participants with Parkinson's said they found it difficult to have sex within the last month. Uh, Dr. Whitman, does that line up with your experience? or it's, cause For me, that seems like a low number. Well, I would say that um, it is a more prevalent situation than perhaps this slide suggests. And, you know, it just depends on how people really answer these questions and how um, um, comfortable they are answering this. I, I meet largely with support groups of um, people with Parkinson's. Those are always very, very, very well attended groups suggesting that it's really quite a big problem for people. And that's why we think of it as a sort of a normal problem in Parkinson's. Yeah, and I, and I think the thing that catches people off guard here is sex within the last month, because a lot of us, uh, me included, are thinking, have I had sex in the last year? <laughs> so the last month just seems too aggressive. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and then 35% of the participants with Parkinson's says they take medication for sexual dysfunction, and we'll get into some of those medications and treatments uh, throughout the day. Um, and then aging, hormonal changes, and some medications also can lead to worsened sexual changes. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the Parkinson's symptoms and effects that can change your relationship. Uh, Dr. Whitman, we'll start with you uh, in, in talking about some of the uh, motor symptoms. Uh, can you can you walk us through some of the some of the points on this slide? Yes. Uh, so um, when people uh, start losing some control over how they move their bodies, uh, you know, not only is there sort of the physical difficulty of moving through a sexual situation, but it can really also affect confidence uh, about um, accomplishing sort of the sexual motions that that people feel that they can, you know, that they can proceed with. 
And um, in many cases, you know, in our research, we have found that sex tends to be very nonverbal for most people throughout their life. All of a sudden, they, there really needs to be more of a need to talk about what's going on and accommodate. So, you know, it, it can make intimacy difficult, as the slide says, yeah. Yeah, well, and uh, you know, m m my wife and I have talked on the podcast about how, uh, you know, sh because I I have stiffness and slowness and tremors, she's sometimes, a, a f because of my motor symptoms, she, she can, she's afraid to touch me because she's not sure how it's going to affect me. Yes, and, you know, that, that, of course, again, sort of highlights the idea that it's so important to talk. It sounds like you guys talk, and... Um, People need to be able to feel comfortable because it interrupts the flow of arousal as well when um, there's a concern that the person with Parkinson's is uncomfortable or that they would be affected negatively. And then, Dr. Vaughn, uh, you know, some of the facial masking and speech difficulties can impact how you show and share your affection. There, but there's also sleep changes. Can you, can you talk about some of the sleep issues that people might have that can also impact intimacy and, and sex, sex drive? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, there may, you know, in a time when someone didn't live with Parkinson's, there might have been traditional kind of times that they engaged in sexual activity with their partner. It might have been in the, you know, in the evening or at night. And as someone's living with Parkinson's, that might not actually be the best time for them anymore. And we'll kind of get into some of those strategies. And, you know, um, and so thinking about kind of what is the best time of day when you're the most awake, alert, when your motor function is the best is one thing to kind of keep in mind and kind of thinking about timing of engaging in kind of intimate activities. Um, same thing, some people may have more sleepiness during the day as well. And so kind of looking at kind of your patterns and what are the best kind of windows of time, uh, you may have to kind of create an environment to promote kind of that intimate uh, behavior, even if it's in a time of day that maybe wasn't traditionally when you and your partner were thinking about having sex. So maybe that's making the room darker and, you know, kind of thinking about it, you know, trying to get blackout curtains or having kind of the bedtime routine in place, even if it's in the middle of the afternoon, because that's maybe the better time uh, for you, yeah. you know, for you. Like some yeah. candles, put some aromatherapy around, you know, uh, exactly. make it your make it your little uh, romantic oasis. Um, and, and planning, you, we, you know, my my my, our, my wife and I, we, we met with a, a sex therapist, and she's like, listen, all your life, you've actually planned your sexual encounters. You know, you made a date on Tuesday for Friday night, so you spent the whole week you know, priming and prepping for that night, knowing that you're probably going to have sex. Well, we, we never wanted to think of it like we were planning when we were going to have sex. And, and now it's we we just need to be more you know, open to ourselves and, and, you know, truthful to ourselves about, yeah, we need to plan this because <laughs> spont spontaneity exactly doesn't right. really work. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, when Dr. we really think Whitten about it, yeah, as you're saying, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Finish your thought there, Dr. Vaughn. Just, I think you're exactly right that even when we think about times, maybe when Parkinson's a little bit part of the mix, we really were kind of planning out those uh, times, got into routines, and we just have to kind of readjust uh, in the setting of Parkinson's. You're exactly right. And Dr. Whitman, uh, the impact of Parkinson's on body image, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. So, um, you know, I think any time that we have any physical changes that suddenly we have less control um, over our bodies, uh, our sort of sense of ourselves and confidence in ourselves uh, begins to erode because we know, now can't predict how we're going to feel and function uh, from a moment to moment. And when it comes to making love, you know, there are two issues. One is how am I going to function myself, but also what kind of pleasure am I going to be able to provide to my partner? So there's just a lot of sort of concerns that, um, sort of when Parkinson's affects the body, that begins to rise in in um, importance. You know, how confident do I feel that I can manage my body well, and um, how well can I be for my partner? So, you know, the, obviously that's a very strong emotional impact. And once we start worrying and thinking about um, how are we going to do, again, it sort of takes away from the arousal. So 
there's got to be, you know, a lot of reassurance that has to go on mutually and, and willingness to be honest and open about what's going on. And I think that makes it much, much more manageable when there's, you know, a person with Parkinson's can be reassured that their partner still feels loved by them, still feels attracted to them, still feels that they can have pleasure in the relationship. So in both direction, it's an issue and, and reassurance plays a very, very strong part. And Dr. Whitman, before we move on, can you help us define what we mean when we talk about sex? Like what, what is the, you know, yeah. is it just intercourse or is there, is there more to it? So I'm extremely thrilled that you asked me this question uh, because <clears throat> it really is a very, uh, very broad area. So, you know, Parkinson's affects people from, you know, perhaps ages, in their 40s and up, but a lot of older people um, are affected by it. And by the time that people get older, oftentimes they're very reliant on intercourse and think of intercourse as sex. In in fact, sex is a lot of different things. Sex is uh, sensual touch. Sex is masturbation. Sex is giving and getting oral sex. Uh, Sex is using vibrators for stimulation. There are all different kinds of ways that one can be sexually active if one's single with oneself or if one's partner with one's partner. I think what's very important for anyone with Parkinson's disease is to be open to expanding that repertoire. You know, we probably all had that repertoire when we were 16 and weren't allowed to have sex. Um, So everybody kind of went in every direction they could, but as people get more... um, you know, as people get partnered, their sex life can become a little bit more narrow and suddenly intercourse becomes the only thing. So it is not the only thing. So I'm really glad you asked me that question. Great. We're going to move on to the next slide. Uh, and this is about sexual changes uh, women have with Parkinson's. Uh, and I'm going to stick with you, Dr. Whitman. And then when we get yeah. to the men, I'll, I'll, I'll get to you, Dr. Vaughn. But if you have something to add here, feel free to chime in. Um, so can you walk us through this side, uh, Daniela? Yes. Yeah. So let me say that when we talk about Parkinson's, we also have to factor into it that um, some of the women who um, are diagnosed with Parkinson's may already be menopausal or postmenopausal, uh, which means that there will be a loss of estrogen in the body, which lowers libido and uh, interest in sex and which causes vaginal dryness. So there could be pain with intercourse. Um, and there may be uh, already some challenges to climax, although usually the stimulation of the clitoris can still uh, be quite viable for, for orgasm. Now, with Parkinson's, when there is um, the decrease in dopamine, it has some of the same effects. There can be a loss of sex drive and then insufficient lubrication, inability to achieve climax. Some of that also depends on... Um, where the um, where the Parkinson's is affect, affecting the nerves to see whether um, you know there's vaginal lubrication and um, comfort with intercourse. So yes, so so intercourse can become painful, and then it's very important to talk with one's gynecologist or one's neurologist about what are some of the remedies for that. And there are remedies. There are lubricants and moisturizers that can be used. Again, vibrators are very, very good for stimulating blood flow, particularly, for example, in the clitoral area that helps with sexual sensations. Um, And even though some people tend to think of vibrators as some kind of strange, born fake penises, they basically just Um, stimulators of blood flow, which is very, very useful for producing sexual stimulation. So, yes, all the things that you see on the slide can happen, um, and it's important to recognize that these things can be remedied and discussed with one's doctor and, um, you know, systematically work towards improving them. Well, you say it can be discussed with your doctor, and I know every time I go to the neurologist, they uh, they ask me on a on a questionnaire about my sex life, but then it's never discussed in the session. Uh, and uh, is that my responsibility to bring it up to him, or uh, should you know? It, it's kind of an awkward thing to bring up. Do you, if you if you're embarrassed, what do you how do you how do you get your doctor to address it? Uh, do you have some tips for folks? Yeah. So 
Yes, I, I do. Uh, in fact, you know, any support group that I've ever gone to, people always really want their doctor to start the conversation because they're not sure whether it should be part of their, like, neurological care um, or they're just embarrassed. So it's ideally the doctor should bring it up, but, but we also know that often doctors don't, just as Larry is saying. So um, first, first of all, you have some tips on a sheet that's available sort of as a part of this podcast uh, webinar. But I think it's important to recognize that this is a concern. Uh, then I think perhaps um, sit down and think about what the concern is and write it down. I think sometimes it helps to leave a message for the doctor that you want to con discuss sexual concerns ahead of time so that the doctor can, A, address your questions, but also in some cases inform himself or herself about the side of sexual side effects of uh, Parkinson's and how to remedy them or who are the specialists that the doctor can refer you to so that you can um, actually get the help that you need. Right. I mean, they may refer you to a urologist to get to, to check you out to see what kind of medication you may need. Correct? Yes. And Yes, they can send you to a urologist. The woman can be sent to a gynecologist. But remember that those conversations are not always in those of, easy in those offices either. So I think right. it requires persistence until you get the right person. And uh, sometimes that person is a mental health provider with um, training in sexual health. Uh, in urology, there's a specialty sexual medicine specialty, and those people are much more likely to have that conversation with you than just a general urologist. We are getting some questions about if sex or masturbation can be helpful to Parkinson's disease by releasing extra dopamine to either of you. I'll, I, I don't think that we have any evidence necessarily of of the kind of potential for it to help with this, you know, releasing dopamine, at least not in some sort of long-term way. Um, I would say that sometimes for some of the lubrication issues that, you know, having more sex will help with kind of uh, lubrication, at least from that's our experience with women. Um, and I, I do think that, um, it, you know, sexual health is a really important part of our overall health. And so I think regular sexual activity is an important part of overall well-being. Um, and so regardless of whether it has a specific effect on the, you know, Parkinson's disease process itself, I think it's a really important part of overall health in general. So Great. I really, want, want I really <laughs> want to second that, if I may. Sure. I really want to second that because, uh, you know, sort of classically when we talk about um, – sexual function, we talk about the fact that a sexual stimulation gives rise to dopamine in the brain. I don't really know how it is different uh, in the brain of a person with Parkinson's, but we all know that sexual stimulation, having orgasms, kind of adds to one's sense of well-being or can. Um, so to the degree that it's pleasurable um, and that it's, that it's pleasant, it can't be anything but something positive. Well, that, that's that's an important point, and I think that we can't stress that enough. And I, I, I'll ask you each to answer this: How important is it for people to have a healthy sex life? I think that it's you know also driven by the the individual and what their own goals are for their sex life. But I think for many people, it's, you know, just as important as your, you know, regular exercise routine and those healthy relationships in your life that help with stress management and your, you know, so I, I, I consider it a, a really important part, again, of someone's overall um, well-being, but the frequency of the activity might vary depending on the, you know, the individual's kind of uh, goals for themselves and, and interests as well. And there certainly can be an aspect of, you know, of anything that's good in our life of also too much or, uh, you know, kind of behaviors that can be uh, troublesome for, for relationships. And so we should also kind of keep that in mind as how is, you know, one's sexual health impacting their overall relationships with other people too. So. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think I we'll get into some of that later. Right. Yeah, I, I want to add 
So, so what I again, I, I, I quite agree with uh, Dr. Wan. So, I think everybody sort of has to look at their own situation and see what's available to make to have a sex, a sex, a healthy sex life. I think a healthy sex life for a single person can be just masturbation. A healthy sex life for somebody who's uh, feeling already quite handicapped by Parkinson's can be infrequent but loving um, sexual contact and affection. You know, I think we have to think about definitions and what, what's available. So that's one part of it. But I want to tell you a story. Um, here in Michigan at Wayne State University, uh, they responded to some research findings um, that um, sexual health, frequency of sexual activity or being sexually active was associated with better physical health. And uh, they took it to nursing homes and they studied um, compared people who were sexually active with people who were not and found that people who were sexually active had a much better sense of well-being, were less depressed. Um, they couldn't really establish the physical health necessarily, but um, there was something about being sexually active that seemed to have a positive effect on much older people. And, and um, I, I think one of the, the fun parts of a sexual relationship with somebody is the uh, the flirtation, the lead up to it, the intimacy, you know, a text from work or, a, you know, a handwritten note in their lunch or, you know, the sort of the build up to that to that event can also be exhilarating and, and fun. 100%. Totally agree. Absolutely. All right. So let's move on to some sexual changes with men. And Dr. Vaughn, I'm going to have you lead us through this conversation. Um, uh, we are getting uh, a lot of questions around this, but why don't you go ahead and start to talk about what some of the uh, sexual changes we can expect in men are, and then uh, we've got some questions from the audience that we'll pepper you with. Okay. So I think because of some of the, you know, um, and, and again, while dopamine is the kind of the neurotransmitter that we focus on a lot in Parkinson's uh, because of the treatments that we have that often are focused on dopamine as well, uh, you know, there are uh, various kind of parts of the nervous system that are involved in sexual uh, performance that also are involved, you know, maybe impacted in Parkinson's that are part of the dopamine system, but maybe part of other you know, systems as well that, you know, involve other, um, like the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system that lead to some of these effects that you're kind of, that you're seeing on this slide. And so it, it is often um, kind of a multi kind of factorial uh, condition. Um, in addition to that, just the impact of Parkinson's, you may also have other medical conditions that the person is living with and other medications that a man may be on that can impact uh, sexual function and so um, just keep in mind that it's even if we're talking about some of the changes that we um, uh, are connected to living with Parkinson's and the impact of Parkinson's on the body that there's often several factors that are um, impacting sexual function which gives us more opportunities again to, to look at different treatment options so as as in women there may be decreased uh, libido or sex drive um, in the setting of uh, Parkinson's with the loss of dopamine now some of the medications that are used for Parkinson's may actually kind of lead to some hypersexuality so this can um, you know but generally what we think of as being related to the um, disease process in Parkinson's leads to decreased libido. There may be some difficulty in attaining an erection or in maintaining an erection that's sufficient for intercourse. And so that's where we have several different treatment options of, uh, that are available to help uh, with erectile function in men, um, which gives us, again, some more drug therapy options in men that are not always available uh, for women living with Parkinson's. In the setting of ejaculation, you could have experienced delayed ejaculation or too early. There are also some medications that are often used in the setting of prostate enlargement in men that may lead to something called retrograde ejaculation. And so if um, there are ejaculatory concerns, then those are also something to bring up with um, your doctor to see if there are medications, again, that might be impacting that as well. And yeah, then, and Dr. Vaughn, um, I can just try. Yeah, I can just chime in here. Yeah. Uh, what you were just talking about that I, I just went to the urologist last month and uh, for some incontinence issues, and, and they gave me Flomax, and they told me that that, that would happen with Flomax, and that would be one of the side effects was the um, retrograde um, ejaculation. Exactly. Yeah, and I was I will say that there's nothing really 
dangerous or, you know, problematic necessarily about not having ejaculation or having the retrograde, ret retrograde ejaculation. It just may be a very different experience than, than what someone has, you know, experienced, uh, you know, prior to that time. And so kind of letting them know to expect that. I think um, I'm glad that to hear that you were warned about that ahead of time, too. Well, and what's interesting um, is with everything yeah. with Parkinson's, it's a new experience. So <laughs> every day is a new experience. So why should this be mm -hmm. any different? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, it's good to bring up things so that, you know, people may not have associated with Parkinson's or realize that this is a potential, you know, condition that occurs also so that if, you know, there are treatments available, those are being brought up to your, your healthcare team and, we often do have things that we can do to help. Uh, does levodopa cause erectile dysfunction? So um, levodopa can impact, I will say, blood pressure. Some, some people who, as they're on increasing doses of levodopa, may experience uh, more low blood pressure. And to the extent that, um, you know, having uh, low blood pressure and could impact the ability of the penis to, um, the veins in the penis to kind of engorge and fill, which is one of the important steps in leading to an erection. Um, I think there's a, you know, that's a possibility. As far as levodopa itself um, causing other challenges, though, I think, you know, we don't commonly think of that as a, as a main side effect of it. And to the extent that levodopa would help someone um, move better, I, you know, it might be that those things would kind of balance each other out and, and, you know, the potential that you have better mobility, which could allow you to engage in activity more, you know, easily. Um, I, I'd say that I would, in general, probably having levodopa on board is more helpful than potentially um, causing, you know, a side effect that would limit sexual activity. But certainly if you're experiencing uh, a lot of low blood pressure with it, we want to bring that up. Right. There is a question here about managing or minimizing tremor while getting uh, anxious or excited, which, you know, can worsen the tremor with sex. Any any advice? On, uh, for... Yeah, I mean, I think, again, if you know that a certain, I mean, you might think about what are the best times with, um, again, your medication effect from your, the medications that you're, you know, the dopaminergic medications, so whether that's levodopa or one of the dopamine agonists, you know, what's the, t it's usually around 45 to 90 minutes for those medications to kind of have, you know, kind of peak effect. It, everyone's a little different. Um, and so thinking about, again, the timing of um, intercourse or sexual activity, intimacy with best function or best on times with your medication dosing is probably really important. Um, exactly right. If there is excitement, anxiety, that does sometimes bring on uh, more tremor activity. Uh, I might suggest that to maybe engage in uh, sexual activity more frequently, and that may help with um, that over time um, so I think it, in, and then having that conversation with your partner about um, what you're experiencing as someone living with Parkinson's and that let's move on forward through that as we can um, are, are things to consider as well yeah and maybe maybe that's not the day you have intercourse maybe that's another that's a day where you do something different mm-hmm um, do you, uh, uh, we, we have a couple comments here on, on how to date with Parkinson's and navigate sex with somebody new. Um, and uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Vaughn, and then I'll give Dr. Whitman a chance to chime in as well, because I think this is an important topic. Yeah, I think I saw a question kind of in preparing for the webinar also on this topic, kind of when to disclose. And I think, you know, that's certainly up to the individual. I would think I'll just Say that if you're looking for a long-term relationship, I think honesty is one of the biggest components of, of successful long-term relationships. And I would, con you know, I would think that disclosing Parkinson's would be something that would come up earlier in the relationship. Um, maybe not, you know, may not have to. Obviously, on the first time you're meeting someone, if, um, you know, if you don't feel like you kind of know yet where things are headed, but I think it would be something that would want to be, you know, there at you know, earlier in the relationship development. Um, and as far as... Yeah, I think it of, also depends on your... It yeah. probably also depends on your symptoms, your motor symptoms, especially if you're, you know, if you're getting if dyskinesia yeah. every day, you probably need to uh, explain why. <laughs> why, yeah. And I mean, I think it's, 
you know, it's part of someone's medical health. It's not like we're always telling everyone, you know, but I think in a relationship, I mean, even if you had a condition maybe like high blood pressure where medications for that condition can also impact sexual function, um, that might be something that in a relationship you would want to disclose at some point if you're going to engage intimately so that someone knows what you're also living with. So, you know, I think it's, you know, it's not something that someone should feel like they have to share immediately, but I think it would want to be early on in the relationship. Dr. Yeah, so, Whitman, any, adv yeah. any advice that you'd like to add? Yes. Uh, what I would like to add is, I mean, I agree with everything that was said. What I would like to add is, <clears throat> you know how when we begin to date new people, we're kind of a little bit anxious to get started, to develop a relationship and so on. I think that... Um, Anybody who's got any kind of a chronic condition has to really look at who they are dating and assess, you know, fairly early on whether you're dating somebody who is a thoughtful person, uh, a person who is compassionate, a person who is um, interested um, in learning about you, um, much more than just the attraction. Because I think when you decide to disclose uh, you know, you, you're testing. You're testing the person, and you're testing whether they can um, hear the information, be interested in more, and you want that person, you want to keep on assessing at any time that you disclose anything. Like, for example, first you disclose that you have Parkinson's before you ever talk about the sexual issues. Uh, as a way of just testing where is this relationship going to be able to go. So I just would say, you know, definitely it's important to disclose and be part of the conversation and part of the relationship in its fullness, but uh, also just keep on assessing the capacity of the person that you're engaging with. All right. Uh, we're going to uh, move on to uh, medications that can impact sex life, and then we'll get into some treatments. Uh, I'm going to start, though, with a question uh, for uh, – we'll start with Dr. Vaughn. Uh, can uh, cannabis uh, impact your, your uh, sex, sexual libido, uh, positively or negative? I would say generally we think of cannabis as being more of a depressant uh, for most activities that involve kind of – you know, particularly neurologic function, and so it does not generally enhance sexual function from kind of that, you know, that perspective. Um, and so I'm not generally recommending cannabis use. I know there's a lot of interest in kind of CBD oil and these other things, but we don't generally recommend uh, cannabis use, and you know, kind of in general um, for park people living with Parkinson's and then not for sexual function. As All right, uh, Dr. Whit Great, uh, Dr. Whitman. Can uh, uh, do, you, do you see sexual changes more commonly in the early onset PD or the older people with PD? So, um, I think that um, I think that there's more of an awareness of changes in the younger people because the you know the change is sort of more dramatically impacts what they are used to, to doing. Uh, and younger people have probably more frequent sexual activity. So there is there is definitely an awareness that things are changing. There are a lot of emotions about what is changing in a sense that people as they are older and may have somewhat lower sex drive and less sexual activity that is sort of less impactful. That's at least been my experience. Uh, every time I go to the neurologist, uh, they ask me if I've been uh, shopping excessively on the internet. They they ask me if I have been uh, hypersexual. Uh, they ask me if I've been gambling, uh, and and oftentimes it's because um, you know it, it can be related to some of the medications you take uh, and right. they can cause those behaviors. Right. Yeah, uh, dopamine agonists are among those that have caused hypersexuality. Uh, can you talk a, a bit about how that is and then what you can do if you find yourself in that situation, Dr. Whitman? Yes. So, um, so sort of the research says that there is a possibility of having uh, hypersexual uh, behavior as a result of, of, of being on the dopamine agonist. Uh, maybe gambling, uh, other kinds of things that look to other people as kind of ad addictive uh, behaviors. They can 
cause disruption in relationships <clears throat> and serious concerns. Uh, it's been my discussion with uh, a neurologist that, that they will change the dose of the medication to improve that. There can also be some behavioral interventions, but my, um, my experience has been more that it has been a matter of, um, of changing the dosage of the medication to kind of relieve that kind of activity. Um, I think sometimes it comes on slowly and it's, it's very distressing and it's very important to discuss it to be able to address it um, as soon as well, possible. Well, I'll tell you what, Dr. Whitman, I've talked to several people who, who have experienced this, um, and they, they actually say it's fairly euphoric. They feel invincible, uh, and they don't realize that it's happening. They're, like, they, they, they're, it's, 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 they're, they don't feel the pains of Parkinson's anymore, and they, they feel like they are um, on top of the world uh, when they're in this state. So it's almost uh, uh, something that needs to be monitored by the care partner. It's the partners who see it. Yes, absolutely. It's the partners who have to address it, and they have to address it with a physician because the, the person who's experiencing that euphoria is not, you know, not necessarily going to reflect on it themselves. And, and let's talk a little bit about the care partner. Uh, the care partner themselves can also be exhausted and depressed and have a lack of sex drive. Uh, Dr. Vaughn, what advice do you have for these care partners that are trying to balance uh, you know, being a, a wife or a girlfriend or a husband or a, 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 a spouse uh, a, and also a, a care partner? Like how, do you, how do you balance that? How do you get over the exhaustion? How do you, how do you begin to look at who you're taking care of as sexy again? Like it's, it's hard. It's complicated. Yeah, I think – Right, I, I, and I don't want to, you know, minimize it to say it's something that could be simply kind of answered, but to say that, again, you know, the that relationship um, has, is built on many things um, beyond, you know, what is now ha occurring with Parkinson's. And so, again, to the extent that if you, you know, we're talking about kind of scheduling sexual activity intimacy times, taking yourself out of the typical routines or, if possible, even the environment that you're in on a daily basis, if it's feasible to, you know, have a getaway uh, weekend, a staycation somewhere at a maybe hotel in town, even um, not necessary, but that's just a way of kind of getting yourself out of your usual routine or environment, maybe using favorite, song, you know, music that you share together in your relationship looking at um, remembering, uh, you know, uh, memories of romantic times. You talked about candles and, you know, whatever those things are that um, you're, you have shared as a couple over the years that bring out the kind of romance and take and really then think about, again, the timing. You know, maybe the best time for both of you is at 10 a.m., you know, or 1 p.m. or something that's maybe, again, a really non-traditional time for your relationship for those types of activities earlier in your life together and, um, you know, try to kind of create that environment in a very intentional way and give yourself, give both of you, you know, um, more time to get in the mood and, um, you know, doing some of those things that aren't maybe the intercourse activities to try to, you know, uh, bring on that, the kind of arousal that was talked about, because it may take a little more effort than it has uh, in previous, you know, years of life. And if if the person with Parkinson's is going through uh, depression or uh, you know, apathy, they may be on some medication that could also lower their sex drive. It is possible, and so I, you know, one of the um, you know things that could be be a way of entering into kind of conversations with a, a physician or um, nurse practitioner, or a, you know, APP that's caring for you could be any time a new medication is being prescribed or maybe prescriptions are even being renewed. If sexual dysfunction is one of the things that's been troubling is to maybe ask at that time even, you know, how will this medication change or um, new medication, will it have any impact on my sex life um, or sexual function um, as a way of kind of opening the door to that conversation too. I mean, I think again, we, you know, with any medication, there are obvious benefits and potential risks and, or we hope there are obvious benefits and, and there's usually potential risks. And so, uh, you know, even with depression medications, 
Um, many of them may have some effect on libido, but certainly, you know, not treating depression is is not a good idea in the life of anyone, but especially in those folks living with Parkinson's disease. So right. I think we have to kind of balance that, obviously. So, so, so are there any? That, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Whitman. I just wanted to I just wanted to mention that you know there are some medications that have greater and lesser sexual side effects. And so speaking to a knowledgeable provider, uh, that can be sort of sorted out, whether the medications that, are, that do not have sexual side effects can be useful for treating the depression in the person with Parkinson's. Uh, that's one thing that can be done. One of the things that antidepressants do is they have an effect on orgasm. They make it harder to come to orgasm. And it's very important for people to know that. Um, and... There have been times where, um, you know, between the provider and the patient, they have discussions about taking a vacation from an antidepressant for a day to be able to experience sexual pleasure more intensely. This is not something anybody should be doing on their own. It's only really in discussion with their physician. Um, but this is something that definitely can be managed. And, again, it's very important to balance uh, as what said be- as was said before, the importance of managing depression versus you know optimal sexual function because anybody who's not going to be taking antidepressant medication is probably going to be depressed and that in itself interferes with sexual function. So the important it's important to treat the depression. Um, uh, Dr. Vaughn, are there any interactions between the PD medications and erectile dysfunction medications like Cialis or Viagra? Yeah, that's a good question. So I mentioned a little earlier that um, particularly the dopa, but the dopamine agonist as well may lower blood pressure. And one of the more uh, common side effects of the medications for erectile dysfunction, like uh, you know, sildenafil or Viagra or uh, Tardenafil or Cialis or any of them really, is that they can also lower blood pressure. So I think we have to be just uh, thoughtful about looking at kind of how blood pressure control is going uh, for the individual um, and um, be, you know, again, looking at overall medications that are being used. Um, for instance, if someone's also on the drug you mentioned earlier, tamsulosin, which also can lower blood pressure, um, we often are telling our uh, men who are taking that to maybe not take it on the day, the tamsulosin, on the day that they're going to use uh, medication for erectile dysfunction like sildenafil, for instance. Um, that's not something that we really can do as easily with the Parkinson's medications usually, um, and so it might be looking at, at dose adjustments at least if um, low bre- blood pressure is part of the um, some of the conditions that someone's living with to make sure it's safe to use the medications for erectile dysfunction if they're needed. Or there are some other potential strategies um, to help with erectile dysfunction that might not involve those medicines if low blood pressure. But I'd say that's the main concern. It's not so much interacting with how the um, you know medications like levodopa work for a Parkinson's. It's looking at, at that blood pressure issue that can sometimes come up. And can they lose their efficacy over time if you use Viagra or Cialis uh, over the course of time? Do you, do you, does it lose its power? I don't think the medication loses its uh, potency necessarily. But, I, I mean, I certainly had patients who said, you know, that worked for me for a while and then didn't seem to work as well. And, again, I think it's reasonable to look at a multifactorial assessment and see if there's other things that have changed in that intervening time that we could modify to try to help. Um, it may be that the disease has progressed and the impact on the, ner- you know, nervous system that's um, – you know, responsible for kind of erectile function or um, orgasm, you know, is is also being impacted more. And so I think, you know, it's, it is, I'd say it's, it's somewhat common in my practice, at least to have people, you know, come back maybe a few years later and say, okay, now what, you know, what's, what's the next step because they've had some where it hasn't, hasn't worked as well. I also remind people though, that, you know, the, even the medications for erectile dysfunction, they don't, 
you know, there are, there's some of the, like the injection form, which most men don't want to do, <laughs> which I don't, I don't blame them at all, is, is maybe the only one that produces an erection. The, even the medications, the pill-based versions, they, they cre- you know, create the kind of environment to have an erection. They don't cause an erection. So you still have to have stimulation and arousal and those other, you know, important pieces uh, to the act- activity to, um, to have kind of an erection occur. So... And there are windows of time that the drugs work. So I tend to find I have better success with some of my patients with sildenafil, which is Viagra, but it only works for about four hours. So you have to, again, be thinking about your window of time for activity. (laughs) Um, You know, you've got about four hours. So it does, you know, that scheduling activity really comes into play. Yeah. Right. But sometimes it's, useful, uh, sometimes it's useful to try Cialis, which has a longer-term effect. But the other thing that uh, some men have used quite successfully has been vacuum devices, um, which are non-medical treatments for erectile dysfunction, <clears throat> which can be quite helpful in creating an erection, um, you know, pumping up, pumping blood from the body into the penis, using a ring to trap the blood, and then, you know, 45, one is 45 minutes to... Um, be engaged in sexual activity. So that's another option. And well, I work uh, for doctor, the VA as oh, go ahead. I just want to say I work for the Veterans Health Administration as well, and they will actually provide vacuum erection devices for people that receive their health care there. So another reason to bring oh, it up. Oh, okay. That's good to know. That's good to know. Um, how, should everybody, uh, you know, that's having these types of issues seek out the uh, some sex therapy. I mean, you know, as you go along, we have physical therapy. We have, you know, other types of therapy. What's, you know, we, we we've listed several here online. But is that is that something that you should bring into your care team? Well, personally, I think that it's very useful. If sex is important to you, then it's important to have somebody who will be your educator, your advocate, and your just information provider. And uh, sex therapists who are familiar with uh, Parkinson's can be very helpful as collaborators with your physicians. It doesn't mean that you're in therapy every week. It just means that you may need to go in to sort of evaluate where you are, what are some of the methods that are going to improve your sexual pleasure and also your sexual relationship in this new setting. And that can be, you know, once in a while visit. I mean, there are people who have relationship issues that would benefit from sex therapy. But I think just having somebody who understands that sex is important, who's familiar with um, sexuality and the impact that chronic conditions can have on it, um, I think can be very, very useful. They're not that available. I mean, there is a website um, uh, um, a A S E C T. I can I can provide it later. Dot org, which um, lets you know the uh, location of every certified sex therapist in every state in the United States. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, we'll pass that along. We'll put that th- uh, in the resources list. Um, and then um, we've talked about some of the pills you can take and the topical therapies. Uh, we've mentioned injections and lubricants, vacuum devices and vibrators. What's the surgery that you would have? So there is a, a, a penile implant that can be um, done by a urologist to um, provide kind of a mechanical way to create um, an erection. Um, and so that that's certainly an option um, and is something that a urologist would typically uh, be the person to uh, consult with, uh, the type of doctor to consult with about that uh, option. There, yeah, there are a couple right. of different types. There are a couple of different types of those devices. Some of them require a fair bit of manual dexterity, so they may not be the best um, implants um, to use, and some are just simply bendable. Um, Uh, implants. Um, And again, this is a pretty major intervention and surgery, so it would have to be very much in the context of understanding the importance of sexuality, the importance of intercourse, um, and and sort of the, the desire to have that capacity. And I want to I want to loop back down to a topic we've already discussed a little bit, but I want to go into more detail. There's a, there's a lot of people, both men and women, who are chiming in on the webinar who um, are are bringing up the the inability to achieve orgasm. 
um, and if you have some advice for them on how they can uh, solve that issue. So the main thing um, to do is to try to uh, be sexually active when very well rested. Fatigue can really influence the ability to have an orgasm, so that would be the first thing to be aware of. Uh, the other would be um, if manual stimulation or intercourse doesn't do the job, then definitely vibrators can be useful, using plenty of lubricant, uh, and uh, allowing oneself um, slowly and gradually move in that direction, trying to be relaxed, create a kind of an erotically stimulating situation. But I would say vibrators are excellent. There is um, a, um, for women, there is a clitoral pump that also exists. If you look on the internet, it's called Eros. Uh, and that brings blood into the clitoris and that, that can help with then with stimulation to bring to orgasm. I want to just, last thing I want to mention is that, you know, men can use vibrators too, not just women, to stimulate their scrotum, to stimulate their penis, to just be playful, take time, but definitely be rested. So you talk about this in such a, uh, a casual way, Dr. Whitman, and for a lot of people, this is very new ground, uh, and it, it can be, uh, they can be uh, fearful of it. They can be embarrassed by it. How do you uh, discreetly go about obtaining a vibrator? Uh, you can uh, go to uh, uh, an Internet location called goodvibes.com. That's a pretty bona fide place to look at their products, and then they will mail them to you. And the mail carrier is not going to go, here's your vibrator. It's going no. to be uh, in a discreet packaging, no. right? There's, yes, there's, there's not a picture of it on the on the packaging, no. <laughs> well, I mean, if you've never ordered it before, it may be yeah. uh, intimidating. The same thing with vacuum you know, devices. I do. I will say thing, something about that, and that is if you travel with a vibrator or with a vacuum pump, just put it in your luggage that you check through so that they, they don't open your luggage and then you have to explain why you have those things, you know, when you go through TSA. That is a great tip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's terrific. Um, and, and then we have some other questions here uh, that we're just going to run through as we have our final eight minutes of the uh, webinar here. Uh, what are some um, um, uh, somebody's asking about testos testosterone supplements? Uh, are, are they helpful in this situation? So I I'll just say that um, there have been several studies that have come out in the last few years that NI National Institutes of Health funded looking at testosterone in um, in older men, not necessarily in in men with Parkinson's. So these are kind of looking at at men as they get older specifically. I will tell you, they had about 700 men enrolled in these studies. They had to screen 50,000 to find the 700 that qualified based on a lot of different exclusion criteria for the studies that tried to rule out, you know, people, like so men with any cardiovascular disease were excluded or obstructive sleep apnea or, of course, any history of genital urinary cancer or anything. So I just want to, you know, I, you know, we see a fair number of, men sometimes being placed on testosterone, and there are potentially some benefits for specific symptoms. Certainly if they, if, if they have very low testosterone, it may help with sexual function. It may help with some fatigue. But largely, it's a very small, num you know, kind of percentage of men, even in the general population, that are going to benefit from uh, testosterone therapy. Um, the other is to really diagnose low testosterone. It needs to be measured at the same time, like three days in a row at a, an early morning testing time um, when the blood sample is taken because testosterone levels vary in an individual throughout the day. And so if you're measuring it at different times, you may get, a, you know, incorrect information. So that's and all just to say that, it, yeah, just so, so I'd be curious about your input, Mr. Dr. Whitman, but I, you know, I just find very few men where it really probably is useful. Because no, I things. quite agree. I quite agree. And the critical point that you just made was, you know, it's not really based on the sexual symptoms. It based, it's based on low testosterone. So a man who's got uh, erectile dysfunction or low libido uh, but has normal testosterone, that would not be a situation where anybody would 
supplemented. It would have to be associated also with low testosterone, and it really is a plus-minus experience for, for men. So I think that it's, you know, it always seems like such an attractive solution, but I think it's not quite as um, successful as we all wish it would be. Um, let's go through some rapid fire questions here uh, so we get as many in, in as possible. Uh, DBS, does DBS surgery, as people are contemplating that or have had that, does that have an impact on sexual changes? I'm deep not brain. aware that it, yeah, right, deep brain stimulation. So I'm not, I'm not aware that it negatively impacts uh, sexual function. And again, as it may very much help um, motor function in particular and potentially lower the need for some of the other medications that are going to that are some of the dopamine medications um, probably again if it does have any kind of impact on sexual function those types of benefits would outweigh that great dr whitman one for you um people trying to navigate sex and relationships with people who are having uh, people with parkinson's who have cognitive decline or dementia uh, yes. what's the advice there so that really uh, does come up um, in discussions, and I think that um, it causes a great deal of pain for the partner um, because they may begin to feel that the person that is wanting sexual activity with them uh, is no longer the person that they knew for all these years because now this is becoming more instinctual and less oriented towards them as a as a person, as a person, partner, partner where they have a history of sexual intimacy. So I think sometimes partners feel guilty and uncomfortable about either limiting or discontinuing sexual activity. And I think that um, it's important for the partners to examine their own feelings about it and uh, proceed uh, accordingly. Um, I think that, you know, physical contact and sexual activity is always pleasurable and sweet, but um, I think that if there is no longer mutuality, uh, I think it's legitimate for the partner to question how much they want to be involved. Uh, okay, Dr. Vaughn, how do you know the difference between hypersexuality and a strong libido? Well, I would say that the hypersexuality is, is when the behaviors are starting to disrupt other relationships. And so if the care partner is starting to complain um, or if the interest is leading to destructive behaviors that are impacting other relation, you know, relationships because of sexual addiction or, you know, staying up all night looking at uh, websites with pornography or that kind of thing, then that's when I would classify it as a, you know, something that's more of a, um, a concern that we should try to intervene upon. Um, okay, and then uh, also uh, real quick, ultrasound wave therapy for erectile dysfunction. What do you know about that? That is a new one for me, and I will look it up. But maybe Dr. Whitman has uh, uh, experience. Uh, I think that this is very much in the experimental uh, phase. I would not recommend that anybody undergo this unless it's in some in a randomized control trial. Uh, that somebody <laughs> legitimate is undertaking. It's it's not a treatment option, at, you know, at this time. All right. Well, I uh, want to wrap this up real quickly with some tips. Again, we want everybody to be open and honest with their Larry, with their their partners. Yes. Can I interrupt you just with one brief comment? I sure. saw on the on the earlier questions. Any advice for the LGBT community? Oh um, yes, that's important. Yeah, I just really wanted to speak to that because um, I think that in healthcare, um, folks, LGBT community folks feel very uh, kind of marginalized and not responded to because nobody addresses specifically their needs. It's very important for people who, with Parkinson's who are gay or lesbian, bisexual um, or transgender to build community. And I think that support systems for people with Parkinson's, just like uh, this foundation or other um, organizations can help people connect so that people can build community, support each other, and um, learn to understand their specific challenges. Great. Thank you, Dr. Whitman, Dr. Vaughn. Thank you so much for your expertise.
Uh, we're going to be sending a link to the webinar uh, for On Demand to listen again. as You can share that as you like, and we hope that you found it very helpful. You can see on the screen that we have uh, the, the tips to talk to each other, to choose your timing, schedule your sex, adapt for comfort or ease. Thank you all for attending. I hope you have a great day, uh, and th thanks so much. Thank you for inviting. Thank you. Thank you.